How's it going, everyone? Great video for you today. Today we have Bloody Pineapples showing us how they take a song from start to finish. Reminder about Bloody Pineapples, they are a band consisting of 16 different members, none of which live next to each other. So what they're going to be showing is how they take a song across all the different members and all their different forms of communication and put it together into something that they then release. Now, what I want to show in this video and what I've asked them to show in this video is exactly that communication, clear communication and how we can use that uh, for our collaborations, for our bands and how to send across a clear message, something that they have done. And they're showing us how to do that on this channel. Hey there, this is Luke with Bloody Pineapples, and today we're going to be going over how we communicate internationally as a band. So our upcoming album, Chains of Suspicion, uh, consisted of musicians in seven different countries and four different states, uh, being in the United States at that. So most of us have never met in person, we only know each other through the messages we've had online or through web chats. So as far as songwriting goes, um, this is how we take care of things. So I have our album chat pulled up right here. So I'm going to take you guys how we went about writing the opening track for our new album, uh, Chance of Suspicion, the album name that's going to be out this summer of 2023. And we're going to look over on how we created the opening track for the song titled Dark Forest. So I was the primary songwriter on this one, and I'm the one who brought it to the bands. So kind of to get the timeline established, I started writing this song in on October 16th of 2022. And... When I was just about done with it, that's when I sent a message to everyone with a brief video of a part of the song right here, you know, saying, I don't know if I mentioned it already, but I started working on a new track kind of in the title of Lorna Shore, um, just to make them aware that there was a new song in the works because we were getting together the songs that we wanted to have on the album. And I wanted this to be a contender for sure. And the other thing I did <clears throat> uh, back before I was introduced to Guitar Pro was if you look at the top, you can see a video of me and my seven string. Um, I used to record myself playing all the parts and almost treat it like a video lesson, saying for the intro, it's this string, this notes, and I would go from there. And then... Yep, I was finishing the breakdown. That was the very final thing to write for the song. And I said, yep, all feedback is welcome. If it's good, then the song will be done. And the other thing to mention is I will be going over how, how the song was written from start to finish. Uh, this video is mainly going to be about the communication. But if you want to see this song get transformed from a blank session to the final products. That'll be on the Bloody Pineapples YouTube channel. And we're also going to have a mix walkthrough through that as well from Ruben, who was very kind to, to agree to that request. So after the demo was done, what we did is we sent it to Australia so it could have some post-production be added. And when I say post-production in this song specifically, I'm referring to orchestration, choir, brass, that kind of stuff. So along with the demo, I also included a document saying, here's the tuning of the song, here are the tempos, all the midis included. Um, for the intro, I was imagining a buildup, something similar to this. Here's a link for reference. Kind of the same idea with the main riff, the verses, the pre-chorus, chorus breakdown, and all parts of the song. So this way there didn't have to be a call or any, you know, miscommunication as to, you know, was this the right vision? Because everything is spelled out here perfectly. So we sent that over. Um, we got the tracks back. And what's so cool about this is, as you can see in the message, the demo I had was originally 42 tracks in total. Um, with the post-production now, it's topped off at 108. 
And then after we got all that done, um, I combined those all into a brand new demo and then posted those in the band's Dropbox. So everyone had access to download it, mess with it, do whatever they wanted. But the first step after that, after getting the demo done, was Sammy coming up with a couple different drum versions that would fit the song. So he worked hard. He spent some time getting together three different demos for us with various different ideas. And if you know what comping is when it comes to recording, it's taking like, think, think of us as comping the demo from this where we have three different versions of the songs and then say we like the intro from version two, we could then pair that from the verse from version three and create our own custom song like that. So he did say that he went pretty power metal on it. And most of the drum recording, the drum parts did reflect that. Uh, my main feedback for that one personally was I did like some of the things that he put in there. There was some ear candy that I definitely never would have thought of not being not being a drummer, but I did say that I think something closer to the original drums would kind of be best for the song. It would fit with the original idea more. And then if we fast forward to the next day, believe it or not, um, he comes back with a fourth version and includes that in the chats. And then at this point, I was kind of having a hard time wrapping my mind around the changes he was adding personally, because this is the first time that I've kind of been through a collaboration like this. So I ended up messaging him kind of one-on-one -on -one saying, you know, Hey, let's, you know, keep this from the original, keep this, keep that. And I'm not including those messages because those, there were so many, <laughs> but what I ended up realizing after all that time was, you know what? He obviously included that for a reason. He thought that was right. So let me try asking him for the MIDI, which he was kind enough to send me. Let me import that into the session I have. And I can use the drum samples I'm familiar with demo-wise to see if those parts do reflect. Or if it was just demo widest or kind of how how his drums were kind of like connected with the original demo and it was just weird to my ear. So I need to make sure that the parts were right and it wasn't just something else throwing me off that I wasn't aware of. And sure enough, it turned out it was, I was being thrown off pretty bad by demo widest was the main big one and not being used to hearing my, my sample drums that I'm familiar with as well. So I imported his parts <clears throat> and in the back in the chat, I'm like, you know what? After listening for the past week, I, I do want to keep what you had in the pre-chorus. And then other than that, it was just little, little changes. Like, you know, let's have the hi-hat hit here instead of the snare kind of reverse that parts. I love the triplets you added and I'm still debating on whether or not to keep the double kick pauses in the chorus. And that was, I'm so thankful that I came to that realization because I ended up sending him an apology after in private, just saying, dude, I'm so sorry, you know, to make you keep changing it when it turns out he had to change it again because I didn't realize that, you know, his ideas were fantastic until I, until they were with sounds I was more familiar with. So that part's on me and that's why you'll see listening to it for the past week. So I really took the time to become familiar with the ideas and not just listening to it once or twice and drawing a quick conclusion. Because there's another thing I've learned from this, this process is don't make a snap judgment right away. You want to make sure that you give it time. So when you give your feedback, you know it's the right decision because I've trusted myself on that with this project way more than I would like to admit. And then after that feedback, um, a week later, um, he sent back a fifth version, changed the blast, blast beats as requested. 
And then, yep, I came back with some more feedback saying, you know, for the uh, the first quarter of the the first quarter of the pre-chorus, let's go ahead and copy and paste that because that part really grew on me, and it would have been a shame to only hear it twice. Uh, for the chorus, I'm still not sure about the the double bass pattern I had versus what he had. We were still kind of debating on that. And then only other thing was in the breakdown, um, there's kind of a buildup with some drum spaces. And I definitely wanted that one of the drum kit to help build that hype. So it blended in with other post-production elements we had. And then at this time, uh, Toby was kind enough to introduce me to Guitar Pro, which is a fantastic tool where you can literally tab out every part of a song or you could import MIDI from your project and it'll tab it out for you. And that saved me so much time. As you can see, I said at the bottom, major credit to the inventor of copy and paste. But uh, the other reason this was beneficial to create is so now our guitar players and bass players in the bands can now look at this project and be like, okay, so whenever Sammy's done with drums, this is the song I have to learn and record note by note. So this way there's no miscommunication. There's no, if basically there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's like, this is the song. This is the part. We got it. And then he sends back a sixth version with all those changes. And then he also voices his opinion saying, I feel the constant kick pattern for the chorus would fit better, but he's willing to do whatever makes us happy, which it, it's awesome because all of that, all of us have that mentality of, Hey, you know, my experience, I believe in this, but you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, strong arm anyone into thinking the way I do, which is so nice about, about everything. So the fact that he mentioned that, I'm like, you know what? You might be right. Let me soak it in for the next few days and I'll get back to you. Because again, with the demo wide is I don't want to, you know, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot for thinking that, you know, this is what's best for the song. And I also don't want to, you know, do that to the band if that's the version that's released all because, you know, of impatience. So then a couple days go back, go by, he ends up sending a seventh version. And with this one, he does do the pauses on the first chorus and then double bass on the second and third one, which dynamics is different. I really liked it. So he sends that. And then I said, dude, this is it. I uh, just wanted to double check that at one measure in the breakdown, we were doing 30 second notes for the kick. If so, then drums are done. And he says on the breakdown, if so, yes, cool. Drums are done. And then you fast forward a couple weeks from that. Um, Max comes in. He's our bass player from Sweden. Uh, he posts a Dropbox link saying, I managed to record and edit the Dark Forest bass. And he went ahead and sent that to Toby for Toby to upload in the bands folder. And Toby did. And that was another, that's another great thing of communication that we have where I think Toby is the only one who was able to edit the band folder. Uh, with him being one of the co-producers on the album, it's him and Jake from Oregon. This way they both they both provide a level of quality control, making sure, you know, hey, this DI is on time, it's up to par, nothing's clipping, and it, it makes everyone's life a lot easier. So then uh, Max comes in, he's like, dude, this song's amazing, the breakdown's disgusting. And at this point, we're just going back and forth and banter, which we do often, because it's not just straight business, you know, like this... Bloody Pineapples is a family to everyone involved. And, you know, it's it's not just strictly work, because if it was, that would be, that would probably be one of the hardest jobs I've ever worked. <laughs> so now I say, you know, thank you. I was wondering how the tapping part would translate on the bass for sure. 
and he's like, uh, which, uh, which tapping part are you referring to? And it turns out that Max didn't play it exactly like the Guitar Pro. So then we exchange a couple of messages. Um, he's saying, I play it like this, and he tapped out the notes he played. And I'm doing the same on the guitars. But the weird thing is, like, I was playing 16th notes, and Max was playing... Uh, Max only played 12 notes. But with them being in the same scale, um, at least to my ear, that is extremely unfamiliar with music theory. Um, I didn't really notice it until I soloed it. Like in the mix, I couldn't tell you which one was which. And Max seemed to think the same thing. So I'm like, okay, cool. Just, you know, at, like there's so many times when writing songs where we have accidental discoveries is i guess the term we'll call it where something happens by accident like you shift a part in the wrong song in the wrong place of a song and you're like oh it actually sounds better there than it did before and you just kind of roll with it and then uh toby comes in as the producer and he's like i think it makes sense to have the bass and guitarist doing the same thing you know which i don't agree with at all so he wanted to track the guitars the same way that Max did with uh, 12 notes. But uh, I did really like that part selfishly that I wrote because it's probably one of the hardest riffs I've ever done. And it adds it, a it adds a really cool element. If you've heard the final song, you, you know what I'm talking about because it's in the violins as well. So I wanted to kind of make my case and say if... You know, if that's what you're thinking, I prefer to keep the 16th note pattern for both of them. Because the drums hitting triplets at the same time help with the contrast of the double basses and the chorus right after. This way, it's it's more of a contrast instead of less of one when you're kind of being guided through the song. So he's like, okay, we'll go ahead and do that. Max, if you wouldn't mind retracking. And he says, yep, all good. And then Max comes in a couple days later. Um, at this time, this is when I was finishing the vocals. Uh, he said, I hadn't listened to your vocal recording on Dark Forest, but holy darn mother of Will Ramos, your vocals are out of this world. Now, I'm not showing that to pat myself on the back or anything. Um, like I talked about accidental discoveries, this was a very irresponsible way of having one of those. Because when I was writing that breakdown, I was actually suffering from the flu. So that's what I told him. I was horribly sick and I had the breakdown idea in my head. So against better judgment, and I don't advise anybody else doing this, I got on the mic and I was able to belt out three syllables at the most before, before everything caught up to me. And it, well, three syllables plus doubles, but again, don't do it. And he's like, haha, things like that make history, followed by the emotional damage meme from, I think, Toby, which wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> so then, with drums and bass now done, um, remember, up until this point, Sammy has just been sending MIDI drums, so he has not gotten behind the kit yet. So he's he wanted so he sent another message saying, "Hey, do we have any updates on the song?" And at this point, I was getting uh, some messages from Toby and Jake saying that they started working on the guitars and to hold off on the drums for now. So I let him know we're working on a few ideas, so we're just going to hold off on the drums for now. So then, in typical bloody pineapples fashion, we created a new group chat because we have about maybe. 15 group chats going on simultaneously so in the messages you've seen so far with dark forest that's not for just one song that's our album discussion group so in between messages for dark forest we're getting messages about drums for another song bass for a third and it's just kind of all going at once but since this was the most technical song in the album then it warranted um, a group chat of its own. So I started the new group chat with Toby and Jake, both 
guitar players on the album and both co-producing it. And I let them know um, kind of my ideas for what the mix are. Not the writing, but for the mix specifically. Because in a track this dense, we're going to have to make some sacrifices for sure. So I said, so for this part of the song, orchestration should be in the lead. Guitars provide a texture. Later on down the song, that flips around and various things like that. And then I keep going on by saying kind of the same thing. Because one of the uh, the biggest things they were talking about was in the demo and what I had written in the Guitar Pro. Um, there is non-stop, non-stop tremolo picking from the main riff of the song all the way up to the pre-chorus. So you're talking about maybe a minute or maybe even two minutes of just non-stop tremolo picking. And that was a, that was a concern of theirs, which... I understand because whenever you see how I wrote the song, you will see a bunch of copy and paste because I am not the world's greatest guitar player by any means. So I start explaining my ideas a little more. And uh, other thing they did is they had, they'd gotten away from what was written in the guitar pro kind of like Max did. And they had wrote their own things. So like custom uh, leads for the choruses you know, a new version of the intro, same with the verse. So they kind of almost rewrote most of the guitars of the song with the exception of the breakdown. So they sent me those and then I was kind of given feedback on that. So that's kind of where this group chat continued uh, once it got started. And then here's the rest of that message. So like I said, the chorus melody, it adds another dimension to the song. Jake did such a fantastic job with that. And if it was just me as a single songwriter, I never would have come up with that idea. So this is what's so cool. Like I've been saying how you can put a demo out there. And then the guys who have been on their instruments for, you know, longer than I've been alive in some cases, uh, they can come in with their expertise and say, well, based off my experience, this would benefit the song. And I'm like, I see what you're saying. So then after that message, uh, Toby comes in and he explains some of some of his ideas behind what, what, uh, what their guitar parts were. So he explains the intro riff, the verse, the pre-chorus, uh, the chorus, and uh, the lo-fi part. And then I go on to import their guitars into the Dark Forest session that I have. And I made a demo for it with theirs blended with mine. So at this point, I was essentially comping the guitars, kind of like we talked about earlier with Sammy's drums, having all these different versions and taking your favorite parts and having that make the final. So that's the Dropbox link up above. And at this point, I'm kind of reverting back on my ideas for the demo because, again, these guys have so much more experience with guitar than I do. It would be such a waste to not, you know, hear that out, to turn it down, to not take advantage of it. And... At this point, I was listening to this demo for maybe two weeks after it started growing on me a lot. And I'm like, you know what? Like, none of us in this band kind of go on a tangent. None of us are like ego driven. Like we're not, we're just not wired that way. It's not like, well, this is my song. This is my riff. Like, why can't we do this? There's just none of that. Because we don't care about like who came up with you know, what idea we just care about. Did we come up with the best idea? Is this the best the song can be? You know, like if, like if I look back on all the projects I've been involved in with these guys, you know, it's just, oh, I remember coming up with a song. Like, I don't remember who came up with what because it just really doesn't matter. The final result is what matters. So then I sent back a screenshot of my doll. And I said, you know, reading back on this, again, I think a lot of the song is pretty mixed dependence. 
And then unbeknownst to me at this point, regrettably, um, I was I was pushing for keeping the opening riff I had in the demo at the time. Uh, but what I did not know is that in the guitars that Toby and Jake sent me, they actually did keep it. They just pitched it down an octave. And then they had a lead guitar match the opening orchestration. So that, you know, that's something, you know, it's embarrassing to admit, but hey, we got the right idea. So that's what matters, you know? So the next couple of messages will be kind of me pushing through that unbeknownst that it had already been done. <laughs> so yeah um i asked him kind of like because when he sent that i put my lead from the demo on top of their guitars i'm saying i can't really hear the lead cut through could eq or amp choice kind of help that and he's like yep uh balance and amp choice will make a huge difference so i'm like yeah i mean if they gel together so if both can stand out with all the songs layers i'm good with it and then at this point, we're getting pretty close to having the final guitar parts written. So I'm like, oh, wait, um, Max should probably punch in the intro, the pre-chorus, and a few other things. And Toby's like, yep, there's a couple riffs, but I did pre-warn him that this might be the case, and he's all good for it. And the other thing we did um, at this point was uh, Toby messaged Sammy to go ahead and get started on tracking the drums like behind the kits because nothing we do when the guitars is going to change what he's going to do on the drums rhythmically like these aren't going to be drastic changes like we start from a wide scope with the demo and then as we get the right parts we just get more and more nitpicky until it sounds good to everyone so then once we got all of that um I ended up sending another demo of what we discussed. So this was with my intro guitar lead taken out. So it actually almost, actually it was all of my guitars taken out. And then I just played with the balance of what Toby and Jake sent over. And did some automation, used some track spacer to make it blends. Uh, something the demo, like I said, I said, obviously the, you know, this what you're hearing doesn't do the composition justice but i think all the parts were there it's just missing you know toby's lead at the start and ruben's ears for the mix and yeah jake was stoked about it toby messaged later saying he was good with it and then after that we ended up bouncing the stems multi-tracks those went off to ruben and as of filming this video right now on May 10th, it is in the middle of mixing. So if you haven't heard the song already, um, I don't know when this video is going to be out, but we'll put a link in the, the description for you. And while you're there listening to it, if you want to see how the song was written and mixed, keep a lookout for the Bloody Pineapples YouTube channel. That'll be in the link below also. And... We'll, uh, we'll put out those videos whenever we're done with them. Uh, we can't wait to share the new album with you guys. And we hope to see you guys at a show soon.